It's my pleasure this evening to introduce uh, Mark W.A. for Kentucky Fried Zucchini. Thank you. Uh, this is how he introduced himself to That's me. Right. Um, Mark taught a technician class that I took uh, a long time ago and uh, convinced me that radio is fun. So thank you for coming tonight, Mark. My pleasure. OK. Good evening, all. So now you know my call sign. I say Kentucky Fried Zucchini because people go, is that KFC? No, I'm not selling chicken. OK. okay. Um, all right. So uh, I will let them stage right, stage left me on this thing here. Um, my name is Mark, WA4KFZ. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, my call sign, or my uh, email address is WA4KFZ at cox.net. Okay. So feel free to contact me later. The topic tonight relates to the Arden Mesh Network uh, equipment and tests that I've been conducting at the Marine Corps Marathon. Show of hands here, how many people volunteer for the Marine Corps Marathon? Okay, good number, good number of people. How many people have thought about volunteering for the Marine Corps Marathon? Okay, better. Okay. Um, does anybody know um, Tom Aslan, N4Z, he used to be N4ZPT, okay. Um, so when I first got into D-Star, he said, oh, you got a D-Star radio, you should come help us with the marathon, and I got sucked into the vortex ever since. Um, so uh, things, it's been an interesting experience. It's interesting to watch the Marine Corps Marathon because the people who put on the event and schedule the medical communications and the race coordinators, they actually refer to it as what they call a planned mass casualty event, which sounds <laughs> odd, but they treat it as a training exercise for Navy corpsmen. They even bring in personnel from uh, like um, residents from other hospitals in other cities to teach them what it's like in a mass casualty event. So it's a good practice exercise for them. Uh, and it's a very big, high profile race. Uh, I would say it's probably just a couple notches down from some of the big ones like the Boston Marathon, um, but they call it the people's race because uh, the entry requirements are not as stringent as something like a Boston Marathon. A lot of people use it as a stepping stone and it has high visibility because it's in the national capital region. All right, so anyway, let me uh, go through what I've got here. Okay, for a number of years, um, for the medical communications. This is just information that goes into a runner database. This is information that pertains to any uh, health or other status on, on uh, the runners that are on there. Occasionally this also ties in with the progression of the race at the various uh, mile markers. But the interest started in using DSTAR as a means of communication for both voice and data and being able to send medical information. Well, the reason they liked D-Star was they liked this, what I would call security through obscurity. Because at the time, the average person would not be able to just buy a typical scanner and listen in on typical FM communications. They can certainly listen in on analog FM, but unless they had a D-Star enabled radio with the AMBI decoder in there or whatever, they're not gonna hear anything. Um, the other advantage with D-Star was ICOM came out with a high speed, and I'll use that in quotes, high speed digital radio they called the ID1. And it ran at 1.2 gigahertz and it ran at a whopping 128 kilobits a second, which is blazing fast for the time when it came out. Um, and a lot of people who were involved in the marathon get very excited about using the ID1s for data transfer because the next step down from that was just 9600 baud packet. Um, so they were looking for ways to be able to exchange digital data and to be able to enter runner information, medically related runner information, into a central database. The one thing that's very important for the marathon is the accuracy of the data that goes into that database, the medical tracking information. They actually will have to go back later and account for each individual that had a medical incident in the race there, and they do that for, for legal reasons. They do that also for practice, okay, just to make sure that they have all these systems set up right. But they will actually pursue this. 
They want to know if somebody comes in that they were treated or not treated, that they left, if they left on their own volition or if they were treated and released or whatever. There's just a lot of concerns about liability. All right. So anyway, getting down to this, um, the ID1s had been used for a number of years and was a pretty good solution. Um, the problem with the ID1, though, is it, it never caught on here in the U.S. Um, given the terrain that we have here in the U.S., 1.2 gigahertz is not the greatest solution for something that is essentially line of sight. And these radios were really intended for more of a line of sight uh, operation. In Japan, they were more popular because in Japan, they have more mountains and volcanoes and they have a lot of flat land. So they put all the repeaters up at the high spots they can look down over a flat area, or conversely, if you're in flat areas, it's a lot easier to do point-to-point -point communications. But here in the U.S., between foliage, between all the hills and valleys and buildings or whatever, it's just not the greatest tool for, for that kind of communication. So it never really caught on. So in the end, um, ICOM has now abandoned selling the ID1s. So that's now off the table. Okay. Um, the 9600 baud packet is considered the backup mode for getting digital data into the, the runner medical database. And unfortunately, um, that initial effort of getting the packet system set up and running was kind of a kludge, a hack job that somebody did to just take the bare bone packet commands, um, extract the data, and just get it into the database. Um, if you know of hams that are good at writing software, this would be a perfect opportunity for somebody to clean up the user interface, whether they use something like, uh, I'll call it like a DRATS, or I'm sorry, yeah, DRATS equivalent, where you just have a form and all you exchange is just the field data. But that's one area that could really stand to be cleaned up. But the one advantage is you can still buy 9600 baud enabled radios. Okay. Um, So, what are your alternatives? Well, clean up 9600 baud, get a better interface. Or, let's look at some of the new technology that's out there on the market. So, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of effort in utilizing commercial grade equipment, reflashing it, hacking it, and making it ham grade or ham radio use equipment. So, there's guys out in California and a couple other areas that started something they called the Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network, or ARDEN. And what they did is they started taking a lot of these commercial point-to-point uh, -point Wi-Fi systems that were out there, they got into them, they hacked the firmware, and they added a mesh networking capability, which is not normally what these radios would do. Normally these radios are intended for what they call point to multipoint. So there would be a wireless service provider with a tall tower and they service a whole bunch of homes out in some area. Here we're doing mesh networking where each node has its own um, same protocol and level of connectivity and if one node drops out others can help route the traffic around. So that gives that a lot of network resiliency, something they don't worry about in the commercial world. So these guys were, were very clever. All right, I really got to hand it to the people who are smart enough to know how to do this kind of stuff. There's one key advantage, though, with the equipment that they are using, as opposed to some of the very early mesh network stuff that was being done. The very early mesh network stuff was done with these old Linksys routers that are just commercial routers. And people love them because you could go to a ham fest and you could buy it for 15 bucks and it was so cute and you could clean it up and take it home. Well, the problem is it only operates in the commercial um, 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. And I'm going to show you why that's a disadvantage. The guys who have been doing the Arden stuff with um, some of the equipment, primarily a brand that's called Ubiquity, they hacked into the radio chip itself and found that they can actually operate outside of the standard Part 15 um, channels uh, allocations that your commercial routers would have to contend with. And in fact, they can operate down into what is actually truly just the ham radio allocated bands. So if you do the channel allocations, channel 1 is the bottom end of the 2.4 gigahertz part 15 allocation. So they actually just started calling these negative channels. 
okay? And these negative channels, minus two and minus one, are actually truly ham radio only. They're not shared spectrum at all, all right? And I'm gonna show you why that's advantageous for us. So the nice thing is they're shared spectrum that we could access if necessary, but we have our own allocation here for 2.4 gigahertz. There's also allocations in 3.4 uh, and uh, 5.8 gigahertz as well. All right. So one of the nice things, if you go to the Arden.org website, they have a nice graphic. I just stole this from their, their site. And they show the various bands and they show this overlap arrangement here. So this is pretty cool. We're ham radio operators, we're licensed, and we can start leveraging their gear and operate just in the ham bands. Has there been a problem with collision on the shared bands? Um, yes, and I'm going to get into that in a minute. Okay, so what would an Arden-enabled node look like? All right, well, here's it. Everybody go to the ham fest and buy these, you know, typical masks or whatever. Okay. Plug one in into an AC source, a generator, whatever, or you can get battery-enabled power supplies. Plug it into your computer. You're ready to rock and roll. Ta-da. Okay. So this is an omnidirectional node right here. Now, the nice thing about these is this is the entire radio. Okay. This little white thing on the bottom here is the entire radio. This is your antenna. The nice thing is there's an end connector. You can take this radio off, and with an end connector, I can, I can hook it up to other antennas. So I can do a mix and match and just leave the radio as being the same radio. Okay? So you do have these options for reconfiguring things, you know, as you go. Let me put this down without hurting myself. <clears throat> so basically, if you go through, look at a typical node configuration, the antenna that I got there is just a 9 dBi whip. Here's the radio itself. Um, the radios come usually in either just a plastic case, which is the more common one they do for cost reasons in the commercial world, or some of them came in a metal enclosure to make them a little more rugged. I recommend the metal enclosure. Um, just like I said, for rugged handling or whatever, but they all function the same way. So antenna, radio, um, power is sent through the ethernet cable. <laughs> sent through the ethernet cable, power supply brick, plug the other end into your computer, you're good to go. So if you add it all up with a couple of bucks for some masks here, you're looking at probably about $250 a node, now, which is actually when you compare that to what the ID1 was, the ID1 radio was on the order of about $1,200, okay, each, all right? You can put a lot of nodes out there for not a lot of money for basically a handheld price. So, um, I had a lot of people initially when there was some beginning interest in Arden and mesh networking and at the time, people were still using the Linksys routers that were out there, the cute little puppies, as I like to call them. And everybody's like, oh, we should run all those in channel one and operate, you know, in the commercial spectrum and all that. And we can still use these little cheap routers and all that. And I was like, nah, not happening. Okay. And they're like, why? But it's great. I said, it's cheap. I said, so what? It's not the way you want to go. So I did a test to try and prove my point. So in 2015, I took my Arden node, I set it up at the medical tent, I work at the medical alpha tent, just set it up, did my normal thing or whatever, and just set the thing up and said, I'm just going to scan and sniff the environment and just listen. Okay. So I set it up, and what you found out was you are saturated by interference from everybody else's commercial system that's out there. So this was a scan with an Arden node at high noon, which is basically when all the runners are starting to come back into the finish line, or the, the, the fit runners are coming back into the finish line. Um, I guess this got kind of cut off. I mean, when I tilt the projector a little bit, dozens of people are out there at any one time. You're now what they call interference limited. It doesn't matter how strong your signal is or whatever, 
you have to contend with all the interference from all of the other signals that are out there. And that includes all of what I'll call the transient signals, all the people coming in with their own little portable MiFi hotspots, you know, that type of thing. So I said, this is not good. This is also going to limit the range that you can operate between nodes if your interference limited. So really the key is this, your interference limited. It's not a power problem or an antenna problem. You got too much stuff out there. So in 2016, I pulled out my back and, and um, didn't attend the marathon. <laughs> um, I remember Kerry came to my house and I loaned him my equipment and he was like, don't move, don't move. All right, so 2017, I was healthy enough to go back and this time I took two nodes and I flashed them to operate at channel minus two, all right, in the ham only band. And I said, I wanna just see and compare the performance from 2015 to 2017 and just see how it works. I didn't want to promise operation. I just wanted to sniff the environment and just make sure that, um, that I'm on the right track here. So I set the radios up. They're operating at channel minus two in the ham portions of the band and just said, I'm going to examine the link performance between two nodes before, during, and after the race. Okay, ran the test, operated at channel minus two, sniffed the environment before, during, and after. So what I did was I had one node sitting at the medical B tent and I'm sitting at medical A and I set up a link between these two points here. These are the other medical tents that are um, along the course here or along the finish line. <clears throat> so what I did was in med B, nobody was sitting over there to help me do this test. What I did is I took a Raspberry Pi um, set the thing up as a web server and just put up a static web page. That's all it was, just a static web page. And back at the medical A tent where I was sitting, I would just hook up my laptop and periodically just refresh the screen and just do some data metrics and measurements or whatever along that, that period of time. So the Raspberry Pi was nothing more than my remote operator. So the distance between those two sites was about a quarter mile. All right. Um, the other thing was the um, distance between them is actually blocked by some trees and the terrain isn't exactly perfect. Um, in fact, one of the things I would do is um, further up in the, on the uh, Iwo Jima Memorial, I would actually have like another relay node and that would really help things as well. So I did a scan here, looked at the performance, uh, like I said, before, during and after the race. But the, the important thing was there was no interference observed. None. Okay. Nobody else was on there. There was, there were two nodes, moi and the Raspberry Pi node. And that was it. <clears throat> During, uh, uh, sorry, before the race and after the race, I was getting data rates on the order of about 30 megabits a second. All right. The radius can operate up to hundred megabits a second. I said, my threshold is if it's 10 and above, I'm good to go, okay? So I was doing about 30. During noontime, when all the runners start coming in, they start entering the vicinity of where the medical B tent was. In fact, if you go back and look at the, the race, that's the finish line right here. Here's the tent bodies are starting to come into the field of view here. The antennas are only up about 16 feet, all right, which is not very high. So what happened was, as people started coming in, I noticed the data rate started to drop. It dropped to about 19 megabits a second. And I, I attributed that to people entering the Fresnel zones of the antennas, all right? If I could get the antennas up higher, wouldn't be an issue. If I had another relay node, wouldn't be an issue. But the bottom line is, I was sitting at 10 megabits or above 10 megabits a second. Gets the thumb up, I'm good to go. Okay. So, um, this said it's very promising. It operated channel minus two, the ham only band. I don't have to worry about interference. The link looks uh, like it's going to maintain reasonable performance. And you ask why 10, why 10 megabits a second? Well, first of all, it's the bottom end of what the modems are really gonna operate at. Second of all, that's roughly 100 times faster than the ID1s, okay? So Kerry can 
tell the great story of last year of what happened when one of the nodes out there going through an ID1 was apparently in the midst of doing an update. Okay. <laughs> and you talk about trying to do an update through a soda straw. All right. And the, the network went, <laughs> okay. Well, if I'm running a hundred times faster, if somebody accidentally has something like that going on, the impact is now much smaller. Okay. So there's an advantage to, to that. So I'm trying to get people interested in um, helping with the marathon, but to help set up Arden nodes and utilize that during the, the marathon. Um, what I'm really envisioning is more of an incremental approach here. I don't want to walk in with great guns and say, yeah, that's it, and we're throwing all the old stuff away. Okay, I'm not, I'm not insane. Okay, I'm much more of a realist to know that you've got to take this in steps here. So I wanted to break this up as something that would be done in, in stages. So next year, or this coming race, okay, in October, um, I set what I called my baseline goals. This is my minimum. And my minimum was to get um, Arden nodes established at each of the medical facilities, as well as up on the hill serving a relay of what we call a med ops location. This is where the Marines have a trailer that has the internet connection, that has, the, it's, it's the main entry point of the pipe, if you will. Um, and there is a ham station that sits here. All right. So what I want to do is being able to have a relay through, have communications, have the internet connection that goes back to the runner database. All right, do that. I want to set that up and I want to make sure that before, during, and after the race, we're doing at least 10 megabits a second. Okay. And then make a determination, do we think the ID1 radios can be replaced? All right. Now, <clears throat> the, the one note that's going to be a little bit challenging is this one. This guy is at the uh, Roslyn Metro. We, okay, we call him Med Echo. Yeah, we, go Alpha, we actually use Alpha Bravo Charlie. Okay. So Med Echo is the one at the end of the line here. For that, <clears throat> since he's sitting at the end of the line, what I was going to do was just use a mesh node like this with a reflector because there's nobody behind him. He's just going to point back towards the other station here. What are the ranges between an omni and a dish? Um, it is strongly dependent on the height of the antenna. Of course. Okay. And any obstructions that are in the way. So, like I said, the test I ran was about a quarter mile. After that, it's, it is truly just a line of sight problem. Um, and in fact, one nice thing, and I'll show you a, a plot, the company who makes this hardware has a very nice propagation prediction tool out there. And you can say the height of my antenna here, or my this and that, or whatever, and goes through and does this kind of stuff. There's nothing to prevent you from going a couple of miles um, with an Omni node and going tens of miles with, um, with antennas that have directionality to them. The radios have more than enough power, all right? But like I said, you're going to find in our area, in, in a realistic scenario, you're going to be more obstruction limited than you're going to be, you know, just pure line of sight limited. So you're really counting on a mesh network functionality if you want to expand that to the region? Um, to give us a higher availability of the link, okay? If I have more mesh nodes, then I have a greater chance of being able to get around these things. For example, if there's, this is a little bit of the beginning of an urban canyon here where the Roslyn Metro is and getting out to this where medical uh, med delta is here. All right. For example, it may be necessary to put another node or something in between here to help relay the signal out because of, you know, certain line of sight obstructions. One of the things we have to find out is do we need another node there? Okay. But the nice thing is these nodes physically are easy to handle. You know what I mean? You're not bringing in huge pieces of gear. You're not having to do a lot of crazy stuff. If you need to stand up another node, it doesn't really weigh that much. It's something that can readily be deployed. And we're only operating for a day. All right? You set up early in the morning, conduct the race, take it all down at night, one day, and you're done. Okay? Some of these tests can be done ahead of time, too. Yeah. Uh, some can, you know, one of the things you got to be careful of in the National Capital Region is when you start walking around doing things, you know, okay. 
so if if you can, you may want to at least tell somebody. You know, by the way, we're doing this in support of the marathon. No, we're not terrorists, and you know, okay. Um, but key things for me, you know, the old Kiss principle: keep it simple. Um, we currently are operating with 9600 baud packet radio and ID ones. Our security is through obscurity. Um, to keep it simple, to avoid oops on the race day. I'm not interested in running VPN tunnels, security. I'm just forget it. Okay, just hook it up, make it operate. All right, all the waivers are signed. Anybody who signs up for the marathon, it's understood that their information is held, you know, is being handled this way or whatever. Okay, that's it. I'm not interested in having show up on race day and somebody forgot the password and you can't get a hold of the person or they didn't show up and, and you know what I mean? And then, then you're up the creek. Just keep it simple. Plug it in, make it work. Okay. So the goal is to get the medical tents, tents or the med stations hooked up. Okay, this year. Next year, <clears throat> we have been running um, an a uh, 1.2 gig uh, D-Star repeater up on the Doubletree Hotel, which is in Crystal City. Um, what I would like to do is to see if we can extend the network out and set up a node with what they call a sector antenna that looks out over about 120 degrees and looks out over the race course to the various aid stations that are along there and have them beam back to the Doubletree Hotel and have a link from the roof of the Double Tree Hotel go back down to the Iwo Jima um, Memorial area and have a bridged arrangement there. So what I want to see is, can we put a sectored antenna up on the Double Tree and look out over the race course? Um, when I did a propagation prediction, it looked like I can cover everything, but one thing that was going to be iffy was, uh, due to terrain, was accessing this one aid station that's near Rock Creek Park. All right, so I said, okay, I'm going to park this problem here for the moment, just get the majority of them, we'll deal with this, all right. I think the, this may actually be easily overcome by either A, getting a taller mast, or B, we end up with some other mesh nodes that can work through that, okay. So, <clears throat> in 2020, that's where I want to get Rock Creek Park hooked up. So now all the aid stations are running. Yes, sir. Um, you're saying that it's possible to leverage a wider area mesh network. I guess my question is who's running the mesh network? Um, I know um, uh, Keith that you know uh, on his website, uh -huh. he has multiple uh, locations mm -hmm. where the transmitter, uh, the transceivers are located. And I know on, in, at my old club, um, on the tower, they had a mesh um, node. Okay. Also All right. So, so this was the MAPEN network? Mid-Atlantic IP I, I network? So, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ken, KE2N, is here in the back. And um, he has been one who's taken over a lot of the MAPEN responsibilities. Um, the thing I don't know about is... The, from what I understand of the MAPEN network, it was primarily a backbone that was running along. I don't know if it has coverage down into those areas. I would have to see what their coverage is. There's so, certainly no reason we wouldn't consider it, but I'm looking for something that, like I said, this is bring it in for the race, do the race, take it home when you're done, okay? Okay, rather than depending on, on somebody else's infrastructure, you know, or whatever. All right. Um, if that in other infrastructure is resident, uh, that would make testing of locations a lot easier. Yes, it would. So I figure if this is two years out, this gives us time to really begin to look at planning. And in fact, one of the things I would like to find out is at least ask the question, can we leave a permanently installed node on something like the Double Tree Hotel? There's also a pl uh, arrangements that were made uh, where we can gain access to another place called the Jefferson Hotel, which is a couple of blocks from the um, the mall. Um, so there may be another location, you know, we could work with. Um, ben and for CV here, um, it's volunteer EMT. He had mentioned in Arlington County, 
all of the um, fire departments have access to all the roofs there and the number of people are hams. So we might actually be able to get access to some of the more desirable roofs in the Arlington um, Island. So I'd area. like to see if we can at least set up a permanent node. The nice thing with the double tree is, like I said, you could leave a sectored antenna, covers the majority of the race course. All right. Um, and then, you know, see if there's other buildings that, of course, we could leverage. <coughs> but definitely say, that's it for ID1s, we're done. Okay. Um, but the other thing I'd like to do is uh, there's been some recent work and there's actually some good videos. If you do a search for Arden, and if you do a search for Arden in the Cowtown Ham Fest in Texas, North Texas, all right, <clears throat> somebody showed that they were able to stand up hotspots and run them through the Arden network without having to go out to the internet, you know, operate through a reflector or, or anything like that. Well, if I can hang hotspots on the network, now I can have people roaming around with handheld radios. And one of the people uh, who does roam around the entire time follows the top doctor uh, who's responsible for the medical operation during the race. They call him Top Doc. And the person who follows him is also a doctor and a ham. They call him the Top Doc Shadow. Okay, they sh he shadows him. But he's walking around, you know, with a, a D-Star handheld and going hither and yon. Well, if we could have hotspots out here, we could start having handheld access going through the network as well. So I'd like to look at adding hotspots, but later. Uh, you know, the key performance metric is greater than 10 megabits a second and getting access to the medical database reliably so that we can get information in. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so, so limited, limited capability for controlling the stuff. But like I said, the one advantage I look at it is even if things go wrong, the advantage is, uh, like what happened last year, was somebody's computer was doing a virus update, okay? But if my network runs 100 times faster than it did before, its overall impact is much lower. So I'm, I'm a realist, okay? We don't sit here and run exercises every month and work the bugs out of it. Everybody's like, okay, come on down. We all hook it all up, and then you're like, oh, no, and the race starts when? Okay, <laughs> all right. Yes, sir. Yeah, if it is just uh, 802.11, just downshifted into the ham band, mm -hmm. uh, do you have to legally um, get it to send the uh, call sign somehow? Your call sign is, they consider that you have identified your station by entering into the Arden um, uh, you know, screen, basically, or whatever. Your call sign is your ID in there, and that's considered identification. Okay. Let me, let me make a, a comment about what Mark's been saying. One of the problems with the DD, the digital data mode in, ID, in the, in the D-STAR system is that when ICOM engineers engineered the connection, they were done by radio engineers, not internet engineers. <laughs> and the result is, is that the repeater, the, the access point acts like a repeater. It talks to one radio at a time. And so if one radio grabs a hold of it to download something, it doesn't let anybody else in. And that's the real problem. If it's switched back and forth like a regular inter internet mm -hmm. con Ethernet connection did, it wouldn't be such a big deal. But the fact is, is that the ICOM engineers said, oh, somebody's going to lock in. We'll lock the two radios together until they're done. And that's, mm -hmm. that's where the problem occurs. Yeah, there's a lot of things, too, they do in Japan that they don't do here in the U.S. Uh, like, I understand the radios, one thing that frustrated people with all the D-Star stuff was that it requires a static IP address. Mm -hmm. And that's apparently how that normally operates in Japan is, like, for each home, you have a static IP address. Okay, we do DHCP, they don't. All right, that, that kind of thing. Actually, we discovered you could do DHCP through it. Are yeah. We, the group here that works with the DD mode knows more about the DD mode than ICOM America does. <laughs> okay, because I've talked to them, and Tom has talked to them, mm -hmm. and we know more about how it works than they do. <laughs> but now that it's, if the radio's going away, who cares? Okay, who cares? You know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on this here? Yes, sir. How do we help out? How do we get involved? With how do you get involved? <laughs> He's been waiting for that. Okay. <laughs> we, we take the line, we do this, and we reel you in. Okay. Um, 
talk to me afterwards, talk to Carrie after the meeting here. Um, I'm definitely interested in finding people willing to help out for the marathon. You know, the other thing too I, I think would be nice is if you're trying to get young people interested in ham radio, this is one of those things that begins to have the look and feel of what they do. But you say, oh, by the way, you're doing this direct connection and it's all up to you. And you point to them and you're doing all this stuff and it's you and you have to do the special thing or whatever. That, that gives them more of the challenge. Standing there with a handheld radio, I think, is pretty old school. It doesn't quite have the sex appeal that, that you would want. But this at least begins to generate some interest, I think, for younger people. So, you know. All right. Any other questions? Anybody? Okay. Uh, my call, WA4KFZ at Cox.net. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Th yes, sir. What is the density of the mesh notes, um, either commercial, private, or anyone in the D.C. metro area? In other words, <coughs> one puts up a on the commercial channel. channel. Say, on, on the commercial channel? No, he's talking about the density of the number of nodes it in our area. If one puts up a uh, antenna in uh -huh. a Ubiquity um, note. Yeah. Uh, what are the likelihood of being able to connect to, to the mesh network? Um, in general, slim. However, Ken, K E 2 N, I would chat with him about that because he has a node that he runs up at um, his house, which is on Bull Run Mountain. And in fact, at work, I work in Chantilly with Ben. We set up a 5.8 gigahertz backbone link from our building at work to his mountaintop location. So we can hang things off of that. The downside is we're only on a four-story building in Chantilly near the uh, Dulles Airport. So it's not like we're going to have great coverage from there, but we're hoping to start hanging things off of that network. But he's got very good visibility. Earlier on, I actually took this air grid antenna, went about 10 miles away and did a test on channel minus two and went to one area um, like on the uh, Loudoun County side of Chantilly and pointed back to his mountain and I was able to connect, okay? So um, if you got line of sight, you can do great things. Um, Ken is running sectored antennas, so he's got some good coverage. Um, he's blocked, you know, with the mountain behind him. He's not going to do anything about that, but, but, you know, he's got a very good field of view, you know, coverage area from there. Uh, we would certainly encourage more people to add nodes, and that's the one of the nice things. If everybody ran on the same channel, that's fine. You're just going to have more stations that are that are populated. Yes, sir. Uh, you showed a map earlier mm -hmm. uh, that uh, might have been uh, mesh. Yeah. This? No, this was. So, but that sort of map is uh, also available for Northern Virginia mesh. Uh, yeah, this is not actually what I'll call a mesh node. So what this was was the company who builds the radios, Ubiquity they have a propagation planning tool. So what I did is I said, okay, the height of the Doubletree Hotel is X. My antenna is 120 degree sector, um, go. How far away can I propagate on 2.4 gigahertz? So green means good, red means not, all right? And what happened is I looked at where the um, Rock Creek Park was, it was just in the red area, okay? Which means I have to hop around it or do something to get around that. All right, <clears throat> but the advantage is I can cover the vast majority of the course just from one high location. Yes, sir. There are there are other uh, nodes and some beams going up and down along uh, eighty and sixty, uh, along sixty six, uh -huh. and uh, uh, off Massanutten as well. I don't know if they're still active, but they were. Yeah, I I don't know. It's one of the things actually. Um, I want to talk with Ken, find out a little bit more of where is MAPEN gone. Um, uh, Keith, what was it, KB3TCB, I believe it was his call. Uh, he was an evangelist to the nth degree for all of this mesh network stuff, okay, the backbone stuff. He bought a van with a pneumatic mast, okay, he was like, um, and and he ended up moving out of the area. So, yeah, so, so Ken is, um, Ken has really been a good point of contact for, uh, for a lot of this stuff. <laughs> Thank you.